why if, if the arguments that are coming out about Gavin Gavin Dr. Gavin Ortland's arguments about this if it's the same old arguments that have been rehashed why does there have to be a new response to some crap that's the same old crap that's been said for a long time and I, I played one of the clips the other day from it and I thought it was funny because they were all like oh he just owned the Roman Catholics on this that's my argument dude he got that argument from me I'm talking about the argument that says that icons were a doctrinal development. Okay, well, the Roman Catholics that say that are wrong because the Seventh Council says it's not a development. It's an apostolic tradition. That was my argument against doctrinal development against Ibarra in multiple live streams. And Dr. Gave and Ortland just cribbed that argument from me. Anyway, let's look briefly at a couple of these points from this text here, which guess what? I got my document cam, document cam. I don't know why I'm singing it like that, but look at this. Check this out. Boom. Look at that. Document cam. What? Woo. That's the book. And somebody's going to say, well, so what? The question was veneration. Well, we'll look at that real quick. So you'll notice that Dr. Hugh Wybrew, who is a Protestant scholar, notes that the sacrifice of the liturgy is mentioned in Hebrews 13. That's a uh, point you've heard me mention many times. The Eucharistic rite comes out of the synagogue and temple liturgy, which we have covered many times. Go watch Lewis's documentary that he made on this. It is based on this book. Oh, we got the document cam. I can just look at that. I can just do that. Look at this. So damn fancy. See that? Lewis's documentary is based on that. Let me go back to the... Get my cams all mixed up. Look at that. Mmm. Fancy. If you would hit like and share. Chad Nerds. And what do we read in Dr. Hugh Wybrew on the history of the liturgy? Well, he notes that everything that you've heard us been arguing for years in this historical Protestant analysis of the history of the liturgy. Oh, it's early on. The Eucharist as a sacrifice. Uh-oh, 160 AD in Justin Martyr. Anybody who's read Justin Martyr would know that. And you'll notice above that it's a triadic offering and that it's eternally present. Christ's commemoration in the Eucharist is an eternal present reality admitted by this Protestant liturgist scholar. Page two. There were house churches and there was the Dura Europa Synagogue, which everybody, uh, you've all seen this, right, has icons. Now, first the discussion was, was there icons, right? And then it was, oh, but were they venerated? Okay, so first of all, let's establish, are there icons? Yes, there's images. Oh, but they're not venerated. Oh, really? What about the many statements of the relics of the martyrs being venerated? You understand the principle behind an icon is no different than the principle behind the veneration of relics. And anybody who's read anything in terms of the post-apostolic fathers, Ignatius, Irenaeus, Martyrdom Polycarp, Justin Martyr, the first and second century knows that Relics were a presence in the early church from the earliest days. Why? Because in the book of Acts, they took cloths from Paul's body and drove out devils and healed people. The bones of Elisha raised the dead. Relics is a biblical idea. Why? Because the relics are deified by the uncreated energies of the Logos. Because when he assumed human nature, he deified human nature by that assumption. And thus anyone connected to his deified human nature is also deified. Therefore, the bodies of the saints undergo the same deification. And thus they become living arcs, living holy things. They are living arcs of the covenant. The converted house churches in the first century are not Protestant strip malls. They're not guitar masses. They're not rock ceremonies and rock concerts. They are house churches converted into things with 
Altars. Ooh, interesting. Why were icons not everywhere present in the first three centuries? Uh, da, it was a period of intense persecution. Did no one figure this out? This is why the liturgy says, which goes back to prior to Constantine, the ancient liturgical rites say, I will not speak of thine enemies, to, I will not speak of thy mysteries to thine enemies. That's still in the liturgies. Why is that still in the liturgies? Because the church was in the catacombs, the church was hiding. So obviously there's not icons everywhere, dummies. This is a no-brainer. Who says that? Why brew the Protestant scholar says that. But guess what? Imagery is present in the 200s in the catacombs. What? See, then the then the, the burden of then the, the the window shifts. Well, there might have been images, but they weren't venerated. Do you understand that the principle behind the Eucharist is the same as the principle behind the relics? And that's that incarnational principle. So in other words, relics is the exact same argument as iconography. And the same Protestant heretics that won't reverence the relics of the saints don't do it for the same reason that they that we that they won't reverence the images. It's the same principle, proving the point that yeah, it's exactly the same principle, and that proves that your churches, by the way, don't have the deifying energies. Because if they did, you would have miracles and you would have the relics of the saints, and you don't. Therefore, you're not the ancient apostolic church. Clear, clear as day. So the irony is that all of Dr. Gave and Ortland's presentation undercuts everything that he thought he was proving in his 30 minutes or whatever it was. Icons in the 200s, early iconography. Prayers for the dead. Oh, what? So everything that we talked about is mentioned and vindicated in Hugh Wybrew's classic liturgical text and it just shows that i don't know i'm not i'm surprised so many people are mystified oh whoa you understand that nothing that dr gave and ortland offered is anything different than was it that's been in every protestant quote mine for several hundred years now so people are mystified by like oh quote mine again whoa it's actually really weak because it's not just a matter of where is icon veneration explicitly in the first 300 years as a theological treatise mentioned by the church fathers. Do you mean to easily disprove that? So in other words, what's the presupposition of that line of argumentation? The presupposition is that we must find an explicit theological treatise in the church fathers outlining that very thing, or we don't have any reason to believe it. And from a patristic standpoint, Oh, you sure you want to go that route? Because where is the Protestant canon listed in terms of the Old and New Testament prior to St. Jerome? Oh, there's not one. So on your own grounds, you wouldn't believe in your own dumb canon. Do you see how lame and low IQ these arguments are? You're too mean. You're too mean. <laughs> I'm not mean. I'm just tired of hearing the same arguments that have been pushed for hundreds of years as if we haven't done countless podcasts and talks and videos about iconography. We've done iconography podcasts with Snack twice. We've done one with Pajot. We've done my own, pulling from the Lossky Ouspensky book. We've gone into great depth about this topic from an old essay I wrote right here. Biblical defense of icons. Pointing out that, I mean, it's amazing that he didn't even think of the fact that the Old Testament and the New Testament writings themselves are pre-patristic witnesses to iconographic veneration, to iconodulia. He didn't even think about that. What? Who? What? Here, I'll put it into the chat for you, boys and girls. Biblical defense of iconography. Joshua bowed before the ark of the Lord. Well, now, wait a minute. And when and when we brought that up to multiple Protestants in the last couple of weeks, Israel prostrates before the ark and the temple and Solomon. 
they're not prostrating before the ark. They're just prostrating and the ark happened to be there. <laughs> oh, so it wasn't the bones of Elijah. It was God healing people and the bones of Elijah just happened to be there when the healing happened. I mean, how dumb is this, dude? Seriously. This is so stupid. It wasn't the cloths from Paul's body. It was the power of God that just happened to be there at the same time as they was blowing their nose with the handkerchief cloth. <laughs> really? Good one, dude. Yeah, you Protestants are solid. Smart. You guys are so smart. <laughs> so smart. How are we going to keep up with y'all? You see how right there, the two strong arguments... Where's the patristic witness for this in the first four centuries? Where's the patristic witness for your canon in the first four centuries? Oh, there's not. Oh, oops. Did you hear that? You want me to slow down? Slow boys? Slow girls in the audience, did you hear it? If the presupposition is that there needs to be specific explicit written patristic evidence and by the way on a protestant position says who why are we supposed to believe that on what grounds just like they do with you gotta follow saint jerome's canon uh why as a protestant am i supposed to follow saint jerome or any of them it's arbitrary likewise if the principle is your presupposition is that something has to be explicitly mentioned in a theological treatise to be believed or to think of it as part of praxis and worship, then your own biblical canon Protestants should not be believed because it's not there until Jerome. Can you follow that? What are they going to do? Who quote mine? Spamming, machine gunning with a quote mine. That's all we got. Ooh. Of course, yeah, of course that's all you got. Haters, you can call in. Open forum. Look at this. We're about to go to some some of the open Q&A. Haters, or look at that. Who else, by the way, gives you the opportunity? By the way, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Horace in the chat. Right, Jamie Aiken was making that Newman argument of doctrinal development. The icons are an accretion that developed over time. Oh, look at my Star Wars figurine collection. I'm Jimmy Aiken. Oh, Nestorius is actually orthodox. I'm Jimmy Aiken. Oh. Why does anybody listen to that, that gigantic, spherical, gutted soy man? I mean, if people, by the way, just think about this. Somebody made it. Sneeko said this. Why are you listening to anybody fat? Why are you listening to anybody fat? Ibarra. Why are you listening to anybody fat? Because you have to add hominem. Not necessarily. Because those are the people that are always trying to morally one up. Okay. It would be an ad hominem if it was just about the issues. However, they all try to morally one up everybody. So I'm just going to say from the outset, if you want to have the moral one up, then you better have your public moral ducks in order. Meaning, if you're a big old fat dude, I don't believe that you keep the fasts or that you morally can control yourself. So don't come at me with all your moral superiority. He's too mean. Jay's too mean. Why is he calling me Bluto even though I look just like Bluto? That's mean. I'm Eric Barr, the greatest papal lawyer the world's ever seen. So look, uh, we don't have a problem making jokes. And by the way, all of these people who won't make public jokes or won't make jokes or do impressions or whatever, they always try to play like the, a Jay Dyer is just too mean. Uh, I'm Dr. Michael Easley, and I talk like this because it dupes really stupid people into thinking that I'm pious because I've got Moody Baptist Bible voice. Oh, uh, don't you believe I'm pious if I talk like this? Uh. I'm not like that. I'm just the real person. This is the real me. So if that's mean, then I guess I'm mean. 
But if you want a simple introduction to iconography as a theological principle, that it doesn't begin with the New Testament. It's amazing to me that did these Protestants not realize that it doesn't begin with the New Testament? It begins in the Old Testament. Do you understand the temple, the ark, the images, the seraphim, cherubim everywhere? That's iconodulia. I'm pretty sure if reaching your hand out to touch the ark kills you, then the ark is a reverential thing. Does that seem like a logical argument? Uzzah? Huzzah! Do you even know what I'm talking about? When Uzzah reached out to touch the ark to stabilize it and he died? Well, that to me says that's a holy thing. The incarnational principle of things being holy is in the Old Testament. Do you understand? Therefore, it is not a Protestant accre or a, 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 a Constantine accretion. And all you got to do is read the post episode fathers to see this. It's not even that much to read. I got that Cyril. What is it, Cyril Richardson? You don't have to go read all these volumes of encyclopedia sets of the Church Fathers. Go read this book. Look at this. I got a document can. It's so fancy. Here's an easy one. I'm pretty sure that's a Protestant too. I think Cyril Richardson is an Anglican. No, even even better. He, even worse. Union Theological Seminary. That's like the worst of the Protestants. Rockefeller University. Look. Early Christian fathers, you're going to find bishops, you're going to find relics, you're going to find uh, all the principles that you find in orthodoxy in this. So Gavin Ortland is relying on quote minds that are old school, tired old things that have been rehashed for for ages, dude. None of this is any anything new. I mean, it looks to me, like, I don't know what his source material is, but I mean, it looks to me like Gavin Ortland is just uh, like doing what James White was doing 20 years ago. You go find James White quote mines. You can go, I got William Webster's whole set down there, which is just quote mines. And then there were Anglican dudes who were Calvinist Anglicans. And you can go all the way back to Calvin in the Institutes. Where Calvin was quote money. Okay, so there's nothing new to this. But <clears throat> I did want to make one last point on uh, originism because in the Weiber book, he mentions origin. He mentions originism. Because somebody says, Eusebius was against the images. Yeah, but Eusebius was a heretic. So the argument is not all the church fathers agree. Okay, that's not our position. There's periods where there's all kinds of debates. The reason I bring up originism is that, and yes, that's my little sock feet. That's my pretty little booties right there. See my sock feet? Look at that. Ah! People laughing at my sock feet. I got to wear sock feet because if I wear house shoes, my feet sweat. It turns into a clammy nightmare. Slipping and sliding everywhere. We don't want that. Anyway. Hugh Weiber says that... By uh, in in the the modus op the driving force of the iconoclasm in this period the first second third century and it, yeah of course it's people like Eusebius they were influenced by Origen and when you go to the seventh council if you read Meyendorf's book Byzantine theology he's got an excellent chapter called monks and humanists which is vindicated by the way in the recent Senecio Glue book. He, he cites and vindicates Meyendorf many times in this book. Because the point is that, yes, it was the originist presuppositions that were driving the philosophical argumentation of the iconoclasts. In other words, it was heterodoxy. So the reason that Eusebius was semi-Aryan was also because of his originism. And the argumentation at the Seventh Council about icons is what are the icons picking out? 
the iconoclast said, because of divine simplicity via origin, via Pl Plotinian simplicity, you can't depict what is uncircumscribable. How can you circumscribe the divine nature, which is uncircumscribable? And origin has a identity thesis view of person being reduced to nature. The argumentation of the fifth, the seventh council, particularly in St. Theodore of the Studite, in on the holy icons is that the icon does not pick out the divine essence it picks out the second hypostasis the sun and you can circumscribe the second hypostasis because the second hypostasis became circumscribable aka incarnate boom so the origin is point is crucial to understanding that iconoclasm is motivated by neoplatonic presuppositions. That's the point. Go read this essay. It's very simple, very down to earth, just straight up. Okay, what are the biblical principles behind implicit and explicit for icons, for images, for venerating the created which has been deified and if you want the best principle behind this you go and you read the decrees of ephesus because saint cyril in condemning nestorianism and by the way gavin ortland and all of his cohorts and all the reform they're all nestorian in their christology and probably some form of heterodox in terms of their trinitarian theology as well because all of this just flows from trinity and christology period all of the theology, all of it, sacraments, ecclesiology, they all flow from Trinity, Triad, and Christology. And that's why none of these people have the correct Trinity and Christology doctrines. So they end up heterodox on all these other things. They don't even know Trinitarian and Christological theology. They wouldn't last two minutes in a debate on those topics. I'm not being arrogant, I'm saying... We tried to have that debate 10 years ago with Turretin fan. Before I was even orthodox. I dude didn't know anything about this stuff. That's that was I don't know if he's still James White's dude, but at one point he was. And so James White, he won't